Hello fellow creatives. Today we are talking about something incredibly important, pretty dry, but extremely important. And we have learned why participant consent, sometimes known as release forms or cast agreements, is really important. So a question these guys might have is, do I need consent forms? You absolutely do need consent forms because even if the person has said it, say on email, yes, I agree to be in your film or whatever it is, however you've you know organised the filming with them, that is not considered adequate by a broadcaster, film festivals, any kind of distributor. They're going to want written consent. So even if you're getting consents for no reason other than to make sure your film can be distributed later on, it is so critically important. And another thing people often ask is, can I just do my consent to camera? Yeah, well, no, it's not going to cut it because the thing is the distributors, the TV broadcasters, the streamers, they need to be indemnified from that participant potentially coming after them. Unless you've got that form that says that, uh, you know, you've got that formal permission and that you're responsible for that permission, then um, they're potentially liable. So they're not going to commission your program or acquire it if they don't have that reassurance. And look, anyone with a legal background is probably going to argue all kinds of things about how if they knew the camera was on them, they knew they were being filmed and there's all these other things. Mm. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, do you really want the headache of having to deal with that legal process? Isn't it better to just do it right the first time and then not have to worry about it downstream? Yeah. And we should talk about the best time to get a consent. I think some filmmakers, and we used to do this, was get a consent before your old camera. I think that's not the right time to get the consent because I don't think you've really built the trust with that person yet. I think you need to be bolder and braver than that and do the interview, for example, do the shooting with them and then consent them based on what's just happened um, rather than um, sort of setting them up and saying, sign this and we'll see what happens. So I think that's the better order to do things and I find it's actually much smoother to do it after you've done the filming. If you've done a really good job on the shoot day and they're really happy and comfortable they're going to sign it because they'd have no reason not to. And I've actually never had a participant refuse to sign it. They might ask for their manager to, to go over it before they send it on to you. But I reckon that's like one in a hundred might do that. Now, some of you might be asking, what about how you use that material? What about how you edit that material? And we're going to come back to that in post-production. Yeah, that's right. So uh, making sure that, you know, when you edit everything together, you're still being true to what you told the person you were going to do with their interview. But as you say, that's a post-production thing. So we will come back to that. So informed consent is an absolutely critical pillar to documentary filmmaking. And sadly, too many people abuse the trust that is implicit in that agreement. Um, and they burn their bridges forever and that's really not advisable. So what we're going to be talking about today is the do's and don'ts of correct consent. We had an experience on the film we're producing at the moment where two participants actually withdrew consent during the process through reasons that were completely beyond our control. It was nothing to do with the project or our filmmaking. It was to do with their own personal concerns. So this happened in post-production and we've had to re-edit big sections of the film because of it. So that's a really unusual thing. I mean, in 15 years of filmmaking, I think it's happened three times. I don't know how to explain how complicated it is, but there are ways to avoid it happening. And so I think we've actually been really lucky that it's happened so rarely for us. And I think it is because we have such a robust consenting process. So some people would say, well, why didn't you just go ahead? You had the signed form anyway. You should just have been able to use the material. And I think this comes back to what sort of filmmaker do you want to be? Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Legally, our lawyer would have said we could continue with using that footage. They had agreed and we'd invested time and money in capturing it and they knew what they were committing to. But it just wasn't the right thing for us to do as filmmakers. The last thing we want to do is put a film out into the world where one of the participants doesn't want to be in it. Like that's, no one's winning from that. So it does come down to the ethics of it. You know, what type of filmmaker are you? You know, I often wonder, you know, like with Michael Moore and his films, how did he go through all these kinds of consenting yeah. processes? Because he certainly filmed people that I don't necessarily, I, I can't even imagine how, or Borat. I mean, how did he get consent for all of that? Yeah, look, I, I don't know. And I think it's an individual choice. But 
It really does come down to the long-term sustainability of your career a little bit as well. So I think, um, unfortunately, it's, it's too common to see filmmakers mislead their talent and sort of present their project in a way that's not a true representation of the final product. And I think you've crossed the line there as a filmmaker, and I think that it will come back to bite you at some point in time. It doesn't mean that you might not make a really great point or possibly even a really powerful film, um, but you might be um, taking a big risk in terms of the long-term sustainability of your career by conducting yourself like that. Yeah, so if you want a reputation that allows people to feel confident and trusting in you when they consent to an interview, then you need to treat them with respect and part of that is the consenting process. So I guess we should talk a bit about what is informed consent, like what does that actually mean? It, basically it just means telling the truth and the whole truth about what your production is as far as you know because you don't always know exactly how it's going to go down when you're rolling camera. So you need to tell the participant what you know about the project, what the intent is, um, what its purpose is, what platforms you hope to release it on. And if things change, and sometimes they do, then you need to stay in touch with them so you can communicate back with them and you know get an additional consent or a reconsent, depending on what that new purpose is. Now we always get written written consent, always a signature. So, but part of that is a lot of people aren't very um, proficient in their reading, and legal documents are really hard to read. So that's where verbally you need to be really clear around what you're doing and what your intentions are, so that when they sign that form, they're really comfortable with what they're signing off on, because that written consent doesn't actually mean a lot if you've misrepresented it in the way you've explained it to them because then it's not really informed consent and it just might not hold up for you later on. So that's why the consenting process is called informed consent because it means that the person has a really strong understanding of what they're committing to before you roll a camera. Yeah, and I think the conversation's almost as important as the paperwork. The paperwork's really important. Most people won't read it all the way through. It's very dense. I wouldn't read it myself. So the conversation, and particularly if there's another person there who can kind of bear witness to that conversation, I find that is really helpful as well. And what's the conversation about? It's about saying, look, this is the project we're making. This is why we're making it. This is what it's intended to do. Your part in it is to tell your story, you know, um, in this way. And we hope to release it on these platforms and get it out there into the world like that. And that's what you're agreeing to here, allowing us to capture the footage and then distribute it in the way that you've talked to them about. Here's another question. If you're filming a crowd scene and there's loads of people in it, do you need everyone's permission? No, you don't. So we recently filmed a crowd scene with about 2,500 nude people um, promoting skin <laughs> cancer awareness, which was a good cause, but we didn't um, consent everyone. And frankly, it would have been impossible to consent everyone. So when you've got um, a, a full frame with lots of people, they become much less individually identifiable. And if they're in a public space, you don't need to consent them. So. I think uh, it's a little different when you're in a private space, like for example, a classroom, you would need to go through that process of getting consent for everyone who appears on camera, but that's a private space. you know. So if you're out in public and you're getting a crowd shot, you don't have to get written consent. And also, I think a good rule of thumb is if anyone actually speaks to camera or you're capturing their audio, you absolutely need their consent for that. But as you say, if it's a big crowd scene and people aren't as easily identifiable, it's a public space, you usually wouldn't need to consent every individual in the shot. So in the 15 years we've been making film, as I said before, uh, I think only three times have we ever had a participant come back and say after the fact, actually, I don't, I don't want to be involved in it after all, for reasons that have usually got absolutely nothing to do with yeah. the film itself. But we've been very fortunate. They might have a police situation or something personal that comes into it, a restraining order or something. It's going to make it really difficult it for It can them. be many, yeah. many reasons. So it's really important that um, you respect that, in my opinion. So that is my advice with getting consents from people is, firstly, get a really good consent form or release form drawn up by your lawyer that covers what you're doing on the production and then always talk people through it before you get them to sign it. And that gives you the best chance of 
firstly developing really good rapport and trust with the participant, but it also means they're much less likely to withdraw consent later on, which is going to save you a lot of headaches. And costs. So if these guys want to find out more, what should they do? Head over to Moonshine Communications Academy. We have a whole section, a whole resources section. There is blogs, videos, podcasts, all kinds of things you can explore and it will really help you with your filmmaking or whatever project that you're on. And we will also be back next week. We're back every Tuesday and next week we're going to be talking more about the gear, like what's your sound gear, what's your camera gear. So that's all coming up. 